Good morning. Uh, let's start with just an overview. What is Enable? Um, this is an example. This little girl, if you look very carefully, you'll see that she has she's missing fingers on one hand, and she is receiving a 3D printed prosthetic hand from one of our volunteers. And she puts it on, and it's entirely mechanical. When she bends her wrist, it makes a fist, and she smiles. To make a long story short, this is what we do. We make children smile. Uh, we make parents happy, and we make geeks rejoice. Uh, Enable started eight years ago uh, when I saw a video about a South African carpenter who had lost fingers in a shop accident, who had gone onto the internet, found a costume maker, said that mechanism could be useful for me. They collaborated for a year over the internet using uh, 3D printers eventually, and came up with a design that uh, could be made by anyone with a 3D printer. This was a YouTube video, and I happened to notice that while YouTube video comments are usually very demoralizing, uh, in this case, people were being quite positive about it. And they said, I would do that. And so I had an idea for a way to allow everyone to do it. I put up a Google map. I invited people to participate. And frankly, to my surprise, People started putting pins on the map because they needed hands and put pins on the map because they wanted to make hands. And as you can see, the devices are not conventional prosthetics, but they are substantially better than nothing. And for the maker community in particular, I think it's very important to recognize that substantially better than nothing is the right criterion. In engineering, in medicine, the prime directive is do something really good um, that I can be proud of. I think in a world in which those methods are failing to reach people, uh, substantially better than nothing is the right criterion. We should do put things out that we are embarrassed about if they're, even though we're embarrassed, if they're going to be useful. Uh, now, Enable started with a few volunteers, um, only a few of whom were physicians, but this one, for example, is a world-renowned um, trauma surgeon who works on very high-tech robotic arms, um, but he was an early backer of ours. He said, I think you guys are going to really make a difference. No one's going to really use our high-tech robotic arms, uh, and we're now a very diverse global community. Um, whose volunteers range from schoolgirls to chapters all over the world. The devices themselves have evolved quite a bit in eight years. Um, and indeed, the device makers and designers include a number of people who are amputees who have used our devices and made them substantially better. Uh, you can see a little bit of the evolution right here. This was the original uh, device made by the carpenter. This is an elbow activated arm that uh, we initiated in my lab in 2014. And you can see that on the one hand, they've gotten very simple. Um, this is a device that has one moving part, a spring loaded thumb, which is still quite useful and also very sophisticated. Indeed, uh, Nate Monroe, the amputee playing the guitar that you saw a minute ago has just released the no insurance optimized prosthetic, which is, I think, the first enabled device to truly rival um, commercial prosthetic devices from a functionality point of view. Um, but that was two months ago. In the last month, we've also seen this gorgeous kinetic hand from Matt Botel, uh, which I think is really quite a significant and extremely well documented contribution to the prosthetic community. All of this is done by volunteers, open source. It's all available at hub.enable.org. And I urge you to go there if you'd like to uh, participate. 
but I do want to point out that while we're now very proud of um, these increasingly sophisticated mechanical devices, we learned that what they do is less important than what they mean. Uh, we first got wind of that when children started calling them superhero hands. And within weeks of this first picture showing up on Fox News, our community had made all sorts, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle hands, Iron Man hands, Spider-Man hands, the whole thing got fairly uh, out of hand. And the significance of this should not be overlooked. After all, every superhero has a flaw. Um, every superhero benefits from some magic or some technology. And for the kids who receive these hands, a mysterious online community of volunteers sending them mechanical devices is really giving them a superpower. And the superpower is not fundamentally in the device, but in the larger networked phenomenon. Um, this kid was interviewed before he got his device, which means it's not the device that was uh, helping him. And he told an interesting story. He said, um, I have a funny dream, a funny hand, and I have bad dreams. In my dreams, there are monsters chasing after me. But now I just turn to them and I say, you don't scare me because I have two hands. This was a kid who hadn't gotten his enabled device yet, but the fact that he was getting one was already changing the way he thought about his device. The social and psychological functions of these devices are at least as important as the medical and mechanical functions of the devices. And it's not just children. I was in Honduras a few years ago and I met these two individuals who had both lost an arm and a half in electrical accidents and had gotten enable arms. And I asked um, Jose here on the left how often he wears his arm because I knew that even medical grade prosthetics are not worn most of the time by most users. And he said, well, of course I wear it every day. I put it on in the morning and I take it off at night. Okay, and I said, and what's the most important thing you do with your arm? Why is it so useful? And this is the picture. He was, he looked at me as if I was crazy. And he said, this is the most important thing I do with my arm. I get to hold my daughter's hand and we go for walks together. Later that day, I met, uh, Christian, who became unemployable when he lost his arm, but he started his own sandal shop, uh, which he was able to do in part because he had his prosthetic arm. He also said that he used his arm every day. And when I asked him uh, what was the most valuable aspect of having an arm, he said, well, when we go out for drinks with my buddies, I can give them a fist bump. So. It's taken us a while, but we've come to realize that the social and psychological network of Enable um, and what it means is as important as what it does. And indeed, in the current pandemic, many Enable chapters have delivered, and we count, we have counts, hundreds of thousands of uh, not prosthetics, but personal protective equipment, face masks and face shields all over the world and in a few countries, Brazil and Lithuania I, that I know of, enabled delivered PPE have been an important component, the major component of that country's response to the pandemic. So when we started this, it was sort of a strange idea, but of course in the time of COVID, it's no longer a strange idea and it's being recognized as an emerging pattern for a world in which institutional solutions to medical and social problems are not always what we would like them to be. Our movement, which brings together many um, emerging internet enabled and socially enabled aspects of peer support and mutual aid, is an interesting complement to institutional and medical solutions. We do this 
not by reproducing institutional methods, not by creating hierarchical organization, but by adopting a more network organization and a more spider-like, a more starfish-like way of managing ourselves. We have chapters in a, uh, 150, no, in about 80 countries these days. We have thousands of members and we have a very low overhead governance system. Everything is optional, but we have a voting system and we have a micro grant program and we have a website where you can find all of the enabled designs and the documentation about how to put them together. And we have a website that tells our story to the world. And we have a strategic planning committee, which mostly just discusses what's going on, tries to identify gaps, and once in a while tries to solve them. This session is mostly about what chapters can do, uh, are doing in Enable, and we're still learning. But I want to talk a little bit, tiny bit more about the general case, which is to say that society still does not do a good job of dealing with people with disabilities. They fall through the cracks. I think that Enable is prototyping not just mechanical devices, but a social safety net which can provide a soft landing for people who have been uh, dealt a bad hand and also give them a stairway to full participation in society and allows them to play a critical role in creating a platform that complements governmental business and NGOs. And that this community and this group is in fact a model for what can be done. Uh, on the very first day when I created that map, I put a lie up on the top of the page. It wasn't true. I said Enable is a global volunteer assistive technology network built on an infrastructure of electronic communications, 3D printing, and goodwill. I've changed it now to say emerging technologies because I think that what we're doing is not fundamentally about 3D printing, but about this recipe, electronic communications, emerging technologies, and goodwill. And I think that now, as we deal with the pandemic, as we deal with systemic governmental problems, as we deal with uh, the realization that institutions have their own blind spots, these non-institutional networked maker-based um, bottom-up initiatives may be an important component of the way we make the better world we're trying to make together. Uh, in these sessions, we all learn, including me, about the wonderful work being done by Enable Chapters around the world. And so I now defer to my fellow enablers to give us an up-to-date on what they are doing. Thank you. Maybe a question, John, what made you have so much success? You know, I think we were lucky because 3D printing and YouTube videos and smiling children with robotic hands, um, those are stories that spread very spontaneously. And so we got a great deal of coverage because it's an interesting idea and it communicates the basic concept in a few images. I think, frankly, that's one of the reasons we were very successful. Um, of course, there were also a number of people telling our story quite prominently, and the website enablingthefuture.org uh, does a good job of uh, communicating the values that Enable is all about. But of course, the other thing is the open source distribution of these devices. We basically put a virus for good out into the world and it seems to continue to be spreading. Medical certifications requires uh, often to close some of the, of the designs and the codes. How are you dealing with that? What we do is we make devices and we provide um, uh, social and psychological support for people who are not being reached by the prosthetic establishment. However, the prosthetic establishment is a fine art of dedicated and underappreciated uh, practitioners who 
are experts at a very difficult process of fitting a device so that it is truly comfortable, truly safe, and truly um, uh, reliable. We're still trying to make that possible. And we are working with prosthetists whenever we can. In the United States, that's not very often. The prosthetic community is well-established and uh, fairly self-contained. And they have not welcomed, um, in general, a community of volunteers and amateurs who are pretending, who they fear, are pretending to be medical uh, experts. We're actually not pretending to be medical experts, and we collaborate when we can. But we are open to doing more of that. And I think you will see that um, the other chapters that are going to be presenting today are, in fact, uh, also working with prosthetists whenever they can. Thank you. Uh, I see there is a question in the chat. Um, I see the question. Yes. Uh, how do you psychologically support the recipient? Um, I don't want to give the impression that we have a systematic method. Frankly, the way we support them is by making these devices available. Um, I believe that that, we have lots of anecdotal information to suggest that that in some ways changes the way they think about their disability and thinks, think about their um, isolation in the world. Uh, we do not, as an organization or as a non-organization, have any systematic psychological support but we are always available and uh, the membership in the community of Enable and membership, fuller membership in their own social community is what I mean uh, when I say we provide psychological and social support. There's plenty of room for systematic psychological and social support, but systematic is not what we do really well. <laughs> So there's still plenty of room for improvement and we're working on it. 